I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to episode 51 of All About Fitness. Episode 51 is a special edition where Professor of History Natalia Petrozella and I discuss presidential fitness. This is in response to Dr. Petrozella's excellent article in the Washington Post, where she reviewed Donald Trump's diet, or lack thereof. I have a link to, uh, I have a link to both the article and a link to uh, an example of what uh, Trump eats on a regular basis. He's been a fr- fan of fried food, and he famously gets two scoops of ice cream when everyone else at the table gets one scoop when he hosts presidential dinners. Anyway, that aside, Natalia wrote this excellent article reviewing you know, the president's current diet and his aversion to exercise and how that's a juxtaposition when we look back at, at what, you know, presidents have done historically. You know, in today's episode, Natalia and I discuss presidential fitness going all the way back to Teddy Roosevelt. We also highlight the fact that many of our former presidents, especially in the 19th century, were military men. So they always had the image of being robust, strong, very physically active leaders. You know, carry that forward to recent times. You know, going back to Jimmy Carter, President Carter, you know, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, you know, H.W. Bush appointed Arnold Schwarzenegger to the President's Fitness Council. George W. Bush was a famous exerciser, and when his knees started bothering him, instead of running, he picked up mountain biking. You know, President Obama was a very, you know, was very active, and he was the first president to have yoga in the White House. So if you're interested at all in a historical perspective, and, and just a little side note, before I got into fitness and exercise, I, was, I worked in politics. I talk about that a little bit in this episode. I worked on Capitol Hill. So I do have a connection with this. This is something I care about deeply. And personally, I feel the president should be a good example of fitness. I don't expect the president to be a bodybuilder by any stretch of the imagination, but the president sets the tone for what the rest of the country does. And that's what Professor Petrozella and I discuss on today's episode. We take a look back at the history of presidential fitness and how that has impacted the rest of the country. And it's been both, you know, a president exercise in office is both the reflection of what's going on in the country, and it also works to set the pace. You know, when we look back at the last eight years of the Obama administration, they were really, they tried the Let's Move campaign. Mrs. Obama was very active in trying to promote healthy options and, and working on making food options a choice for people in inner cities. These are important issues. The president has a very important role to play in helping people understand that regular exercise, a healthy diet, and healthy lifestyle behaviors can go a long way to promoting good health, which in this day and age, when they're talking about repealing health care, that's very important. We certainly can't count on government to provide health care for us, but it is a fact and is well known and well documented that regular exercise and healthy behaviors, like making smart nutrition choices, getting good sleep, drinking plenty of water, avoiding the stuff you know you should avoid. All those behaviors can go a long way to promoting your health and fitness, so you have to visit the doctor less often. After a brief word from the sponsors of All About Fitness, Dr. Natalia Petrozella and I discuss presidential fitness and the role that presidents have played in setting healthy behaviors for the rest of the country throughout the American history. Vicor Fitness is the maker of the new TerraCore, which is a step, bench, balance trainer, and multifaceted exercise tool combined into one single platform. Go to vicorefitness.com to see the newest piece of equipment that will be taking the fitness industry by storm in 2017. Use the code AAF to save 20% on purchasing a TerraCore of your own. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness. Vicor Fitness. Better results from better products. Active Motion Bar is the first resistance training bar where 30% of the weight is a moving mass. An Active Motion Bar can help you strengthen your fascia and elastic connective tissue as well as your muscle, which is important for staying injury-free during the aging process. Research has found that exercising with an Active Motion Bar can be up to 170% more effective than using traditional weighted bars. Active Motion Bar, let the resistance move you. www. Dot A-C-T-I-V motionbar.com
I'm Pete McCall. This is All About Fitness. And today I'm on the line with uh, Natalia. Natalia, can you do me a fa- favor and pronounce your last name for me? <laughs> sure. It's Petrozella. Not intuitive, I know. Petrozella. So Natalia Petrozella, can you give us a little background on, on what it is that you do and uh, kind of your, your background? So I think it's so unique and, and so interesting. Yes, definitely. So I'm a history professor, associate professor of history at the New School University in New York City. Um, And I've written one book about education policy called Classroom Wars in the late 20th century. But I think most relevantly for this uh, podcast, I also have had about a 10-year career teaching fitness, a mind-body class called Intensati at Equinox and in other places. And now I'm bringing these two worlds together and I am writing a book about fitness culture in the United States. And um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of writing about that actually on a lot of the fitness and wellness blogs and other places too. And, and, and one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with Natalia today, and, and for listeners, I really apologize about having another Equinox person on here. <laughs> just, I don't work there anymore. I, no, you don't, I, you don't no. teach there anymore. But I mean, no. it just, I think, but I've made the point because I've interviewed a number of people that have been affiliated with Equinox, who work with Equinox. And it just, it goes to show that, that the company attracts leaders and they hire leaders within the fitness industry. And I would definitely, <laughs> but I'm, I'm serious, I would definitely qualify you in that. But one of the Thank reasons, you. but the main reason why I wanted to speak with you today, Natalia, is the article that you wrote for the Washington and post on why Donald Trump's diet is bad for America's health. This ran at the end of June. And, you know, I want to stay, as, as I mentioned, you know, getting ready. And so for listeners, I don't want to critique the president, even though there's a lot to critique there. And it's not really so much the president personally, but what I do want to take a look at, and the reason why I want to speak with Natalia, especially since she's a professor of American history, is the role that, that politicians um, in general and presidents in particular have played in kind of setting the mood for healthy behaviors and exercise. So why did you, what, what prompted you to, to write this article, Natalia? Well, one of the things that I noticed is that there was this attention in the media to these very particular aspects of our president's um, wellness lifestyle or lack thereof. Like, you know, Time Magazine was reporting that he has double scoops of ice cream and, um, you know, uh, other places, Vox and The New Yorker are commenting that he believe he doesn't exercise because he believes that we have um, a, a finite energy supply and that if you use that energy supply on exercise, that it will run out and that that's a bad use of your energy. And so I started thinking like, wow, this, this guy has a really unique um, kind of approach to wellness wellness, which is not really in common with what we see kind of, you know, dominant expertise in line with today. I also, though, I think to your point, Pete, about not making this like a nitpicky critique of him, like there's plenty of policy to criticize Donald Trump on and we won't get into that. But I was also a little bit troubled because for all of those potential policy critiques, it seemed like a lot of the nitpickiness on him was like a kind of devolving into this sort of fat shaming. Like, you know, Alec Baldwin said in The Atlantic, he couldn't run a mile if he tried. That's what he looked like. And I thought, well, I think actually let's go top level and think about the policy implications. And so long answer short, long story short, really what's fascinating is that presidents across the political aisle for definitely the entire 20th century have made a pretty strenuous um, point about exercising and being healthy, being just virtues, right? Things that the White House should promote and things that they personally promote. And um, we'll go into examples of that. But here with Donald Trump, who is saying, I don't exercise. I hate exercise. Give me some more chocolate cake. He's actually putting forth a very different kind of personal example. And I think that's worth thinking about for those of us who care about health and well-being and fitness. Well, and I'm going to go, and and this is, I'm going to go kind of and do an an outlier look at this or kind of go and sure. against the grain look at this because there has been some research of that that too much exercise like ultra endurance training is not good for you you know mm-hmm. when you look at that that i who was i was speaking with somebody um juan carlos santana i did an interview with him and he mentioned the fact that that they're taking a look at that high volume training especially in endurance athletes could lead to an early death. I mean, just this year we had Bob Harper, you know, who's yep. been on The Biggest Loser, who's a really fit person, have a heart attack. You know, he mm-hmm. survived it. He, he it wasn't fatal, thankfully. But we had Edmund Burke, Doctor Edmund Burke, who wrote the book, literally wrote the book on heart rate training, died of a heart attack. Jim mm-hmm. Fix, who wrote The Joy of Running, yeah. died of a heart attack. And, and they they're seeing now that some of these ultra endurance athletes 
are are dying earlier than the average person. So I don't want to say that that Trump is right, but it's not I don't want to it's also not an illogical line of thought that that there is a certain finite. But at the same time, exercise dictates your overall health. You know, and, and, you know, in preparing for this, I mean, one of the things that we were just speaking about before we recorded was going back to Teddy Roosevelt because Teddy Roosevelt was president in the, in the era of physical culture and he was famous. He damaged his eye boxing with a Secret Service mm-hmm. agent, you know, mm-hmm. and he would go hiking through Rock Creek Park. So talk a little bit about what presidential fitness has kind of meant over the years and, and why that's an important why why it's important for, for the rest of the country. Yeah, absolutely. I think to your first examples, um, I guess you could come to the conclusion that exercise, you know, will not save you from early death, right? And that too much exercise could kill you. But, you know, his Trump's particular theory that you have this finite battery, I mean, that actually was dominant scientific belief in the late 19th century, but science overall has <laughs> di- disproved that. So I do think it's yeah, important. No, it it was. No, you're 100% right that it was, yeah. you know, but the 19th century was eh, a little bit more than 100, you know, 115 years ago, right. 120 years ago. Yeah, with the program, right. <laughs> so it's and not it's actually, wrong. Yeah, go ahead. What? No, no, no. It's not wrong. But when you look at the doctor that he that he the doctor he held up during his uh, you know the doctor he referred to during his campaign, yeah, he maybe he's going relying on nineteenth century thought. But anyway, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're but trying anyways, to make so this personal. Let, let's get back to Roosevelt. So yeah, so I think really the crucial. So Teddy Roosevelt, just to give us a little history lesson here, early twentieth century president um, was a strong believer in what he called the strenuous life. And for Teddy Roosevelt, that was a lot of outdoor activity activity, right? That's hunting. That's, um, you know, he had been in the Rough Riders in the Spanish American War. So there was a militaristic element to that. It's getting outside. There was the boxing dimension to it too. And I think it's important to realize like our exercise fascinations or trends are always connected to bigger things that are happening, right? In society. And at that moment, when he's saying we need to get outside and lead this strenuous life, it's also a period of urbanization. There's a white collar economy when people are starting to have more desk jobs. And so there was actually a lot of panic that young boys and men were not going to be masculine enough, right? And so that they needed to engage in all of these character building activities that were supposed to restore, you know, this kind of American manhood or masculinity. And I think what's really most relevant there and maybe says more about our current moment is that Teddy Roosevelt was one of these early presidents to make a very big connection between exercise and virtue overall, right? To be like a good, full American, you need to have this strenuous life too. And I think that that connection, even though it's moved away from, you know, hunting and and boxing, um, has stayed very much with us in our presidents, not with Trump. But I think until there, you see echoes and different expressions of that definitely throughout the 20th century. Well, Well, two things come to mind. You know, we have to, for people that don't realize this, the late 18, maybe 70s to the 19 teens, you know, maybe the First World War was the era of what we call physical culture. That's yep. when you had the first gymnasiums. That's when the YMCA became popular. You, I think it was the Boston YMCA or the, even the Minneapolis YMCA. But that's when the first, that's when exercise first became popular. And the irony mm-hmm. is the, the gymnasiums of that era look a lot like the CrossFit studios of now yes. where you had gymnastics equipment and kettlebells and medicine balls. But so, so President Roosevelt was kind of a, a uh, kind of a living up or kind of following that. And, and what people don't realize or may not realize, and this is from having read one of his biographies not too long ago, that, that Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, was very sickly as a child. And so mm-hmm. he used exercise to really improve his overall health and stature. But one thing, Natalia, I want to want to talk about real quick before we go into present day. Historically, haven't our presidents been generals or been been military figures like general you know obviously George Washington Andrew Jackson you know we have Ulysses S Grant so if we look to pre- to presidents as former military figures doesn't that automatically kind of bring with it this connotation of strength and and physical kind of capacity Absolutely. I think that's really important. That has historically been such an important part of the presidential profile. And in some ways, definitely with Roosevelt, the um, his romance with exercise is an extension of that. But I think what's interesting, and this comes in the era after Roosevelt, certainly with K- 
Kennedy um, and and even the Bushes and even Carter, you see this kind of democratization of what exercise can mean, that it's actually, yes, it's about being a good American, but it doesn't necessarily have to be about a kind of militarized body to defend America. And that has a lot to do with gender too, right? So that like when we're talking about Roosevelt, he was not celebrating girls going out and going hunting and no. doing these things. No, he it was the, yeah. right, the, the presumed citizen was a man, right? That and that's still a little bit so the case, I think, with Kennedy as well. But that changes later on. And I mean, look at to jump way ahead to the Obamas, like the linchpin of the Let's Move movement. It was Michelle Obama. It, Beyonce was a booster of all that. And look at gym culture today. Very, very disproportionately female, especially, you know, well, we could argue that, but, you know, women are highly represented there. And so I think that to your point, your very smart point about the military prerequisite, I think it's totally tied to fitness early on. It doesn't stop being tied for fitness, but our broader cultural understanding about what fitness is tend, then goes like far beyond what you get through mili- through the military. And, and so let's look at let's look at like most recent like because we can agree that the kind of, kind of second wave of, of gym of popularization and, and I don't want to 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 tread on your book here, but I think That's okay. and you, you've probably looked at it. But but gym culture started becoming a popular again in the, in the mid to late seventies. That's when you had the Cooper <laughs> Clinic in, in Dallas, Texas, come out with jogging, and that's all this also the same time when Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger, some some uh, German guy or Austrian guy named Arnold Schwarzenegger, was winning a bunch of you know bodybuilding titles, and they they created the movie Pumping Iron to highlight yeah. that. And so you know modern let's let's look from modern gym culture, call it the early mid seventies and on. And and what how have presidents done that? In your article, you specifically referenced Jimmy Carter. What what did Jimmy Carter do? What did President Carter do um, to kind of bring this to bring this to the forefront to kind of highlight that fitness plays an important role? Well, Jim, can we uh, can we roll it back from Jimmy Carter Absolutely. to John F. Kennedy? Yeah, let's okay. do that. Let's go no. back to Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, yeah, you're absolutely right. In the 70s um, was a big, big moment in gym culture. And that has to do a lot with an expanded notion of what exercise should be. In many ways, this guy Schwarzenegger was, yes, he rose to popularity because fitness rose to popularity, but really that whole bodybuilding muscle head thing was beginning to be part of an older era of what it meant to be fit. And Cooper and his clinics, which were about the value of aerobic exercise and jogging. And by the way, I'm sure you know this, but you know, jogging in, um, in, uh, Brazil came to be known as Coopering because he was so, <laughs> he was so connected to the rise of jogging because it was, you know, cardio was, came into, into vogue. Um, so Let's bracket that for a second. But I think in terms of sticking with this presidential fitness theme, a big um, jump in terms of the White House supporting um, not just a president who kind of displays, um, you know, being fit himself, but also has policy to back it. It's first Eisenhower who introduces the Presidential Council on Youth Fitness um, in the 1950s. And then maybe unsurprisingly, it's JFK who becomes the real poster boy for it. And I I say unsurprisingly because JFK looked the part. If you can, I mean, most anyone probably remembers what JFK looks like if you're an American listener, but um, you might not remember Eisenhower. Eisenhower was this old balding man who'd been president of Columbia University. And let's just put his, his politics aside, you know, military hero, but he didn't exactly, you know, he wouldn't have been the Instagram like fitness <laughs> dude of the 1950s, right? And JFK really fit that part somewhat paradoxically, because we now know that he actually suffered intensely from various health problems and was in a lot of pain. But there's this amazing um, spread in Sports Illustrated that maybe you can link to, Pete, and when you release this in, in, on Facebook or whatever. In 1960, he... Um, was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and he wrote this article called The Soft American. And it basically was this promotion for exercise to be a good citizen and really saying that if you are a soft American, and he meant soft as flabby, you are not only flabby and soft of body, but you're soft of morals and virtue and all this stuff. And that gave rise to um, expanding um, Eisenhower's Presidential Council on Youth Fitness to be just the Presidential Council on 
on fitness. And that's where we get all of this funding for PE programs and for public recreation centers and for community rec stuff. And I think that is super, super important because it also, think about what that means. It's also a public commitment to creating fitness opportunities. They're federally funded running trails in that period, right? And that's in some ways gives rise to the world that we have today, but also is starkly contrasted because that's all publicly funded stuff, right? And think about, I mean, look at you and me here talking about like, oh, Equinox, right? I think fitness culture is bigger than ever, but it tends to be a privately um, financed endeavor today. So and that's actually, um, yeah. let's, let's, let's pause it on that for a second, because one of the things that, that's so important to remember about the Eisenhower Kennedy era, and actually I just, I just finished reading uh, Eric Schlosser's book on, um, oh. on the nuclear program. Brilliant. And he did a great look at the nuclear program. So for listeners, I don't just talk exercise. I'm also, I was a political scientist. I was telling Natalia, I was a government undergrad. Yeah. I actually worked on Capitol Hill for a little while before I got into fitness full time. I had more fun at my part-time job at the health club than I did working, <laughs> uh, working in policy issues, uh, in DC when I got into fitness. But, but, but when you look at the fifties and sixties, the big thing driving all American policy at the time was what was was the Cold War. The Cold War, absolutely. And that's that soft American. Why was the soft American so dangerous? It was so dangerous because he was unfit to fight the Cold War. And if you look at these videos from PE, the PE classes that came out of this, um, there's actually a new documentary about this, trying to bring back this era in PE classes, which we can find. But um, it looks like military training. I mean, this is not today's like, let's play dodgeball or gaga. It's like, you know, fully militarized lineups, people doing these crazy, like, um, climbing walls and carrying each other and stuff. And then also a pretty hierarchical system of rewards. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but you know, if you were elite status, you wore Navy shorts, if you were lower level, you wore red shorts. And the whole idea was that the one's physical fitness was a prerequisite to be a good, a good cold warrior, but it also wasn't just about the body. This was about this. They'd never use the term holistic in those days, but this was about this like whole self improvement process, um, of which physical cultivation was a really important part. Well, it and, goes back to Ar- it yeah. goes back to Aristotle's thought process of a sound body <laughs> with a sound mind, right? I mean, it's yeah. kind of like you can't have you can't have one. You can't you can't be effective in the classroom without having a. a body too. And before we continue, I think it's important to note that the first group exercise was originally done by the German military back in the 17th century during their military training. You know, when they would go out, the Germans or the Hesh, I think it was the Prussians at the time, you know, maybe not 17th, maybe it's the 18th century in the 1700s, were the first ones to institutionalize training as a part of their martial preparedness for the military. So it's something I read about years ago and has always struck me that the first grip fitness instructors were really from the military. But let's go. So let's go back because there's one thing I want to highlight from the article that you wrote in the Washington Post yeah. that I think is just fundamentally brilliant. And it, and it ties into this discussion, especially in talking about what Kennedy was doing during the 60s. And that is I'm looking for the quote here is um, you make a point. You made a point about health, unequal access to food and exercise. Mm-hmm. You know, so during that, during what, what, what was Kennedy trying to do in the sixties? You mentioned this a little bit that, that with private health clubs, but why is having une- why is the unequal access so important? Well, okay. So sticking in that era, I mean, and no one was really talking about healthy food in the way we are today, but about this exercise point, I mean, the idea was this is a prerequisite for good citizenship. And so the government should provide, uh, the government has a responsibility to provide opportunities for people to pursue that fitness, right? And it was a pretty compelling argument. And like I said, it gave rise to PE classes and community rec centers and all these things. But what's fascinating is that it's It's almost like there was the federal government and there were a lot of local governments, by the way, that then worked in tandem with with this federal initiative. That's the way things work in the United States. Um, There was this great public impulse and very effective at getting people kind of, you know, passionate and excited about the importance of exercise. But in many ways, it was the private sector that then took that up and really carried it forward. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the public support has, has fallen out from that. And I'll say, because we started talking about the Cold War, paradoxically, 
it was the Cold War that killed some of that public support. And I'll say what I mean by that is in the same way that Eisenhower and Kennedy made this strong case for fighting the Cold War being the reason to have all of this physical cultivation stuff available and funded, by the 1980s, um, especially around this particular report called A Nation at Risk that came out in 1982, there was a sense that at that stage of the Cold War, the main way that the U.S. was falling behind was because American academics weren't good enough. And so then you get this pendulum swing where, wait a minute, to fight the Cold War, actually what we need is better science and better um, mathematics training, and the Russians are killing us there. And that's not the first time that's happened in history. We know about Sputnik in the 1950s, but the the result of that in the 1980s, which is also a broader period of austerity, right, and a lot of cuts, but budget cuts, then you have these programs like PE and fitness and community fitness um, opportunities. You have them being cut very, very frequently. And of course, the 1980s, I mean, that is simultaneously in a kind of bittersweet way, the, a high point in American fitness culture. That's Jane Fonda. That's the Sports Connection. That's all of these private enterprises enterprises taking the place in some ways, but I think we should ask about who was left behind, right? Who couldn't afford that health club membership? And I think those are still really important questions. Well, and you also, when you look at that in the 70s and 80s, what did you have happening? You had the suburbanization of America, right? You had a shift, you had a major shift from urban centers out into, you know, the major, you, you started developing suburbs. So when, mm -hmm. you, when you had major, when you had people living in major population centers, it was relatively easy to fund parks, to fund trails, to, to put mm -hmm. the funding there. But as people moved out, as people started developing the suburbs in the 60s, 70s, 80s, did that shift? Did that I mean, because you talk, because I think this is such a fascinating, and maybe you and I are the only kind of fitness historical <laughs> geeks that are out I there. I hope not. So maybe this is a very a small end of, of people interested in this stuff. But you look at it because by the time that the, the, the fitness wave hit in the 80s, we had we weren't making an emphasis on on outdoor public recreation, were we? I mean, is that anything totally. that you've noticed in your, in your research? Yeah, definitely. So I would even, let's back date um, suburbs to the 50s. And one of the reasons that um, Kennedy's uh, 1960 soft American thing hit such a chord was because, because of this suburbanization, there actually was this panic about heart attacks among men. Because what did suburbanization do? It won, it, 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 what, one of the things that it did is that it meant that men in particular, these suburban guys, were sitting on trains or on freeways, going to work, they're being sedentary, then they're sitting at desks all day. And so there was this panic and there was a true rise in um, heart failure. And so the idea was for the first time in American history that it was seen this way, wow, you needed to change your habits. You needed to actually incorporate deliberate exercise into your day because the norm is sedentary. So I think that one aspect of the suburbanization is exactly that. But then the one that you point to, which I think is very important as well, is that when when affluent people and largely white people left cities in 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and onward, you had this loss of a tax base, right? And so when you have these hollowed out inner cities, which tend to be poor people of color, no surprise, given what American history looks like, um, they get left behind in many ways, right? And so those public services and beautiful public parks and running trails and safe outdoor spaces, et cetera, tend not to happen anymore because a lot of the tax base that had supported and advocated for them has gone has gone elsewhere and either has other publicly funded you know uh, places to do these things in their new communities or they're paying for private uh, or they're paying pr for private access to these and, and see, but that comes that ties in because when you look at it, I mean, in what the late sixties, early seventies, in like New York and some major urban areas, you yep. had the heroin wave, and then totally. in the eighties, you know, I grew up in in outside right outside of Washington D.C. in the nineteen eighties, and that's when you had the crack e epidemic, mm -hmm. and, and literally, you you there were parks that, that were beautiful parks, less than a mile from the capital, less than a mile from the capital, Natalia, that you would not go to unless you were fully armed and with, you know, with, with military, yeah. you know, with military, because it was just a dangerous place. And, and what's, and, and so let's, let's shift back to what role, what roles do presidents play? So you talked about Kennedy and his soft America, what role in the last 40, 50 years have presidents played in kind of shaping the American fitness? They're kind of shaping the American um, fitness zeitgeist, if you will. 
Well, I think that um, on the one hand, like being a personal advocate of fitness has almost become required. I mean, Jimmy Carter, one of the big, you know, moments that he had was when he was photographed jogging, right? And that was considered like, you know, in some ways it's very undignified for a president to be seen like all sweaty and and out there. But um, that was considered, you know, look, even this guy is getting in on the jogging trend and not afraid to look kind of, um, well, you know, did- uh, well, sorry, did, didn't he walk? Yeah. I thought you might have going to go this. Didn't, didn't President Carter walk? It's a little bit more than a mile from the Capitol where the swearing-in ceremony is to, to the White House. Wasn't it, was it President Carter or President Reagan? I think it was Carter who walked that you know, in, in, instead of riding the limousine. Am I, am I, do you, do you, I don't remember that story, actually. We can look it up. And, and yeah. uh, I'll look, I'll look <laughs> but I'm pretty sure. You know, I'm pretty sure because I remember I was actually on the West Lawn for President Reagan's first swearing-in wow. ceremony. We were just, I was like eight years old. And and we had my, we had just moved to DC a, a year or two before, and my mother was working on Pennsylvania Avenue, and so I was at this. And and what I remember about that is I remember, you know, I thought it was normal to be within a couple hundred meters of of a president, but I remember watching the presidential parade, and we had to come in from the balcony because they had all the Secret Service guys on the roofs around the building. And you know, as a nine year old boy, that that's that's the stuff you remember. <laughs> but that's so cool. <laughs> but but so so Carter so Carter talks about. You know, Carter represented that with jogging. And then what happened with President Reagan? What did, did well, uh, yeah, Reagan, I actually want to stick with Carter for one second because yeah, there's another, tw- another twist that I think is little known, which is that one thing I thought was interesting is that, you know, Carter, he continued this presidential council and this presidential focus on fitness. And one of the things that I've learned through my research that he did is he hired one of the consultants he hired was this woman who you might have heard of. Do you know who Jackie Sorensen is? Yeah. She created that. Yeah. So she created this program, Aerobic Dancing, which, um, <laughs> Uh, literally emerged exactly at the same time as Jazzercise, but separately. They're very similar programs, um, but they emerged at different times. And Sorensen was on the East Coast. And, um, and and the reason I think this is relevant is so she had a very successful business model and was really in the private sector. But there you have the White House hiring or not hiring, but consulting with this kind of private fitness personality to build policy for schools and a kind of federally funded fitness policy. Now, that is something which I think shows this kind of change over time. You don't really hear so much of that today, right? We know that Michelle Obama goes to SoulCycle, but do you see like Soul Cycle creative directors being brought into the White House to create PE curriculum? Like, not really, right? So I think that that's an interesting transition, too, in thinking about this public-private relationship. So I'll just leave that there. But Reagan, getting back to what you were asking about, um, yeah, one of the things that we were discussing before that's so interesting about the way Reagan did this public display is that in some ways, he is the modern day Teddy Roosevelt and he's talking about being on his ranch in California and the outdoor life and that like rugged, um, out that rugged, um, lifestyle as, you know, his form of exercise. However, and the same spread, I'm thinking about a particular spread in parade magazine in the early eighties. He also has pictures of himself on a Nautilus machine working Mm. out. Right. And to me, that's really interesting. If you think about that continuum and thinking about what that meant, Like going to the gym, especially, well, I won't say especially, going to the gym for men, straight men, was considered super suspicious in the 50s and 60s. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger gets interviewed in the 1970s, and I will clean up the language a little bit for the way I paraphrase, but he says very defensively, like, just because a man wants to work out and have a nice body does not mean he's a homosexual. And it's so interesting, like today it's like, yeah, of course it doesn't mean that. Like, you know, in some ways going to the gym is like a mark of being like a dude, right? Well, um, and sorry, but but a few yeah. years ago, I think it was either Esquire or GQ did a great expose on the Venice Beach gym culture of the 70s and how yeah. a lot of the early bodybuilders were kind of funded by older homosexual men who yeah. just wanted to hang around them. And that was a, So you're hitting on something very important there, especially having, I mean, I was a personal trainer in DuPont Circle in DC, which is the, it's a predominantly rainbow flag, you you know, it was a predominantly gay neighborhood in Washington, D.C. And and at that point in the, in the 2000s, it was 
I didn't give it a second thought. You know, it just was, you had, you could tell. The funny thing is, that well, then we'll get back to it. But the funny thing yeah. is you could tell the straight guys were all the guys in long sleeve sh- t-shirts and sweatshirts <laughs> and ball caps. And then the guys that were there that weren't straight were wearing tank tops and tight t-shirts. You could easily tell walking to the gym <laughs> whose who team, who? Who, whose team people were on. But it's just, oh, yeah. if you're part, if you're part of the gym culture, just, you got to shrug and go with it. It's not a big right. deal these days. But so right. what, what did that spread by Reagan? What did that, what did that mean? And how did that kind of normalize fitness a little bit? Yeah. So there's a, basically what you're alluding to is there is like a whole other episode, maybe even a whole book to be written about the way that the gym has helped mainstream gay culture. And that is such an important story too. But I think I point that out because the fact that Reagan, Republican, family values, the guy who wouldn't mention HIV AIDS as it's raised, as it's raging, that he's photographing himself in a gym shows that there is, I don't want to say he's causal, but shows that there's this major shift in American sensibilities about what it means to go to the gym. And then it's becoming this uncontroversial, even very positive um, activity, social activity that we're expected to participate in to be good Americans. And I think like, I mean, uh, for this podcast, especially because your listeners and you are such um, astute, complex thinkers about exercise, but I think it's really important not to be like, oh yeah, Teddy Roosevelt advocating hunting is the same thing as Michelle Obama advocating <laughs> like cardio <laughs> hip hop dance. Like, no, like the modality matters, right? And so to have Roosevelt sitting on a Nautilus machine in the 80s shows that there's a real change in the place that the gym is occupying in our American consciousness. And that only goes on. Like, um, you know, uh, George... H.W. Sorry, George W. Bush is like this huge advocate of running and puts a. He apparently he had installed a uh, treadmill on Air Force One, and you know we've really seen this this become like a totally uncontroversial part of American of the American leaders, right? That working out is a good thing. Well, even going back to H.W. H.W. Bush was famous for his can, can a buck port and you know playing golf and being being active. I mean, you yeah. know you can you can say that they made fitness a virtue. And, you know, any and again, any policy issues I might have aside with with both Bushes, you know, since his time leaving the White House, even in his 90s, just in the last year or two, H.W. Bush has been jumping out of planes um, to, you know, to, to yeah. celebrate the fact that he, that's how he survived being shot down in World War Two. And, yeah. and so when the Clinton let's let's so from H.W. Bush, because I honestly don't remember too much about policy. But what did H.W. do that was pretty instrumental with the president's fitness council during that time? Who did he appoint? Do you know who he appointed to the council? I do not remember who he appointed to the council. He, he, he put Arnold. Don't. H.W. Oh, is the sorry. one who made. Oh, is that right? OK, yeah. so you tell me. Yeah, yeah well, no, I mean, but but again, that's just from paying attention to it. In, in the, I think yeah. it was, you know, H.W. was what, 89 through 93. And, mm-hmm. and he put Arnold Schwarzenegger on the President's Fitness Council as a representation of, again, that, you know, that was when, when Schwarzenegger was huge. Any Schwarzenegger movie was him yeah. blowing things up. And, and I don't, that's any, you ask any guy my age, Natalia, what got us yeah. into fitness? It's going to be Schwarzenegger, Rocky Balboa, um, John Claude Van Damme, the, the, the movies of the 80s. You know, that's what yeah. got us into fitness, you know. So not only is Reagan sitting on a Nautilus machine, but you're seeing, you know, Schwarzenegger beating the snot out of people in movies. And you're like, I want muscles like that guy. And then you're watching WWF wrestling on the, on the weekends. So, but yeah. that's, but that's what got my generation interested in this fitness culture of wanting to be larger than life of wanting those it, big muscles. But let's, interesting. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But yeah. say, so let's look at, let's look at it. Cause I want to respect your time here. Yeah. And, and um, let's look at uh, kind of the HW and Clinton era. What was Clinton famous for? What was, you know, kind of Bill Clinton famous for during, exercise and health wise, let's forget about other stuff. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> what was Bill Clinton famous you for? You want to have a long conversation? So Bill Clinton, it's interesting, you know, since he left the White House, he's gotten very healthy with his eating and really changed his diet. He was known not, he was not known for being particularly healthy in that regard when he was in office and indulging in a lot, in a lot of ways. Um, but he was also a runner and that was something that he promoted there. And I think that there's an important distinction, again, looking at the different ways that these presidents are active, like appointing Arnold Schwarzenegger 
Um, and like, like you're saying, these muscle movies of, the, of that time is promoting a very different kind of active body than, than like being a runner or later on when we get to like, you know, a much more feminized thing when you have yoga on the White House lawn with the Obamas. And I think that you see, uh, I think that uh, Clinton is kind of part of that, not really getting on board so much with like the Schwarzenegger archetype, but something maybe a little bit more inclusive. And, and and Clinton was, I mean, yeah, Clinton, I think, was embodied the everyday man. And I remember because yep. during during summers during college in the early '90s, I worked in a bar in Georgetown, and there were one or two times when I'd be getting off work really, really, uh, really early in the morning, and I would actually drive by the White House to see if I could catch him jogging because he oh, was really? famous. Well, he was famous for going jogging, and there was a McDonald's on 17th Street just a few blocks away from the White House, <laughs> and I literally would do that circle around the White House and the, and, and the, that 17th Street McDonald's because he. He was famous for jogging and then stopping the McDonald's before going back to the to the White House, where people lived in D.C. in the area era. Well, that also show, I think that that's so funny that there's not like such an apparent contradiction in those days between you know McDonald's and going jogging that we were not quite at that you know holistic wellness well being conversation where we're at today, right? Where organic food and exercise are kind of part of the whole um, the whole picture. And, and and to look at and and the H and during the W Bush the George W Bush years that's when I was personal training in D.C. and actually during that era um, uh, Reagan's former uh, deputy chief of staff uh, Don uh, not Don um, Mike Deaver was a client of mine so I da- trained oh, Mike Deaver for a couple of years and it was really because I had worked uh, for handgun control and this is just a cool little side bit of history since we're talking history yeah. but I worked for Jim Brady and uh, then I trained Mike Deaver. And uh, Mike Deaver told me a story about the shooting, about the the, the assassination attempt, and that was at a um, that a press uh, a reporter asked uh, Reagan a question. So Deaver went to pull Brady in front of Reagan to answer reporter's question, right as right as uh, Hinckley started shooting. So wow. um, that was you know it's kind of cool to have met two people involved in, in one of the few presidential assassination attempts, and to get that bit of insight. But um, Mike passed away a few years ago, so I don't mind sharing that story. He passed yeah. away due to pancreatic cancer, but he was a very – he was into fitness. And, and you know, you're know, you talking about yeah. this picture of Reagan. He was also into the image of – I think you know the Reagan presidency is when we really started seeing imagery um, mm-hmm. of a strong president, kind of Reagan on his, you know, his, his horse, Reagan yeah. doing his work at his ranch. And that kind of continued to, to George W. Bush because what was George W. famous for? Running also. I mean, that was um, that was a huge uh, for him, a meditative state. Almost. He talked about how some of his big insights came from um, from running and from the kind of clarity that he got, particularly after he'd overcome addiction. I think that's interesting, too. Right. To see that is connected to um, that healing process as well. I, uh, yeah. Sorry. No, but that, and that's a and that's a big thing. And and W was actually very. He was a big proponent. I I did. I was at a health fair in two thousand two at the white uh, on the west lawn of the White House. And 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 again, I might have my policy issues with George W. But he he gave he and I remember this Natalia because he got it. He was in the speech. I was like maybe ten meters away. Um, cause we're to go, it was going to be the president and then it was going to be, um, the first lady. And then I was with a team that we're going to be doing an exercise demo. But mm-hmm. by the time we got up there, all the cameras were following the president around. And so nobody was paying attention <laughs> to us, but the president got up there and he said, you know, he's like, and I remember he said, get outside, play with your kids and don't drink and don't smoke. And I know that I know that and I, I joked to a friend of mine that Carl Rove was going to be getting phone calls from the liquor and tobacco industries later in the day to to get the president not to say that message. Right. Um, right. But I, I really have a lot of respect for President Bush because he did he did embody that he was very fitness and very health oriented. Mm-hmm. And, and let's flash forward now to Obama because we mentioned the Obamas. And when I was at the American council on exercise, we worked, I'm trying to remember his name, but he actually, we worked with him. He was president. He was uh, Michelle Obama's personal trainer. And he actually would became, he would work with us and do various um, promotional things with the American council on exercise. Um, the American council on exercise got on board with the let's move campaign and was a big proponent of that. But what did, mm-hmm. how did, how did the Obama, Obama's really um, represent health and fitness, and, and what did they? How did they kind of change that 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 kind of tenor and what they did in the White House? 
Well, I think one of the things that's super interesting about what they did is that, you know, for a lot, first ladies tend to have initiatives that correspond to kind of traditional female undertakings in society, right? So in some ways, childhood nutrition fits right into that because mothers tend to be associated with cooking, et cetera. But as everything we've been talking about in here suggests, like exercise is not usually one of those things. Like you mentioned, you know, appointing Arnold Schwarzenegger as like those muscle movies, right? And there's been a really like masculine um, emphasis on what exercise means. But I think that the Obamas changed that in a lot of ways. One, in quite obvious ways by appointing Michelle Obama to be by her making this her cause, right? And expanding what exercise means. It's not just about being a kind of, you know, a a muscular guy. It's about, in many ways, you know, self-affirmation and empowerment for girls. But I also think there's an interesting um, dimension to the fact that it was the Obamas that brought yoga to the Easter egg role and that they had um, yoga classes on uh, there. And um, President, sorry, the White House statement on, I believe in 2012 said, you know, we're so happy to host yoga here because it's really become the universal spiritual language of our time, right? And I thought that was super interesting that they chose yoga, which is still, you you know, a pretty, I mean, it's very mainstream in many ways that lots of people have tried it, but most Americans have not tried it, right? And that they connected kind of well-being to not just jogging, not just a kind of militaristic fitness challenge, but to yoga also. To me, that's a big statement in terms of inclusiveness. And I should say beyond rhetoric, in that particular Easter egg role with the yoga in particular, they had people working with disabled kids doing yoga on the White House lawn. And I think that's really important too, because one of the negative flip sides of like the Kennedy rhetoric, the Eisenhower rhetoric, all of these people is that like, if you don't have a fit body, does that mean you are unfit for citizenship? Does that mean if you're disabled or unwell or fat or, you know, can't be part of this for a lot of reasons that you are by definition a bad American. And I think the Obamas did a good job at um, expanding that definition or at least working to. Well, and I think to to wrap this up, I think the one thing that's very important with yoga and with exercise is the cognitive benefit. Because can you you say with with the presidents, I mean, all the presidents we've mentioned have been, whether people agree with their individual policies or not, and and maybe except for the last year or two of of the Reagan administration, but haven't all these presidents been seen as as individuals who are very sharp and very kind of, I don't want to say authoritative, but very just, I would say sharp and just, and, and, and very clear minded. Oh, yeah. There's no question. I mean, no president is promoting um, fitness like because I want a slim waistline. Right. I mean, in the more modern era, you definitely, of course, obesity is a conversation that's happening, but much more for health reasons than for aesthetic reasons. And I think that implicitly or explicitly, for sure, throughout the 21st century, throughout the 20th century, there's this through line where the understanding and I think it's a good understanding is that if you want to be a fully actual person cognitively, emotionally, spiritually, taking care of your body, and that can look like a lot of different things, but taking care of your body through physical activity is really important. And it's not just for athletes or for soldiers. It should be for everyone. And I think we're I think we're to leave it there because it really comes back yeah. to that is is that exercise is about it, you know it's just what we mentioned earlier with Aristotle it's about having not only a sound a sound mind but a sound body. So Natalia, this has been a fascinating conversation, and I definitely want to do it again. Where can people? What you have your book coming out, and you do a podcast as well, right? Let's give a little plug yes. for that. Definitely. If you like this kind of conversation, I have a podcast called Past Present, where we turn hindsight into foresight. And it's me and two other historians. And we talk about everything like the kind of stuff we're talking about today, but also different headlines. And um, you can get it on iTunes, drops every Tuesday. Awesome. And then do you have uh, do you have a date yet? Uh, You have a title for the book. Do you have a date yet? Uh, no, not yet. I'm working on it, but I do write a lot. So if you, if you catch me on Twitter or Instagram, I just started a public Facebook page this week. Um, you can get all the updates. Okay. I'll have you, I'll have your uh, social media tags down below and I actually will have thank a link you. to your website. Natalia, thank you very much for, for your time. I really appreciate it. I know you got to run. So thanks for your time and enjoy your summer on Long Island. Thank you. This was great. I look forward to talking again soon, Pete. Thank you very much. You know, hopefully you got a lot out of today's conversation. It's not the normal type of guest I'm going to have. If you liked it and you would like more, though, please do me a favor. Send me an email, pete at petemccallfitness.com, because I certainly am looking to expand this podcast 
beyond just a typical raw, raw fitness um, type guest. And I want to kind of give you a different perspective about what fitness means, how fitness fits in. You know, I'm going to have one or two people from outside the fitness industry. I have a friend coming up who is a financial advisor. We're going to talk about financial fitness and what you should be thinking about in terms of investing and how to save for retirement. So I just don't want to make this podcast. This is all about fitness, but that means everything. When I look at fitness, fitness is a wholesome, you know, everything involved in our lifestyle. How active are you on a regular basis? Do you take activity breaks at work? You know, planning your meals out, thinking about your food choices, thinking about activity. Now, I certainly am under, I am under no impression that the current fitness or lack of fitness of somebody in the Oval Office is going to impact how you exercise. You're going to exercise because you enjoy it. You're going to not exercise because you haven't found a reason to exercise. I don't think anybody's going to get up and join a health club or go for a run or even take a hike, you know, based on, you know, who's in the Oval Office and what kind of shape they're in. I really don't. But when we look back at it, as we discussed today, we look back at it, the president is a reflection of what's going on in our society. You know, right now it's divisive. It's, you know, red versus blue, you know, Republican versus Democrat. That's a bunch of nonsense. You know, as I talked about, I grew up in D.C. You know, my mother worked in politics, you know, so I grew up very close to it. You know, there are a couple of times when she would have to take a cab home from work on a Friday night because she was down at the bar on Capitol Hill. And that's when members from both parties, this was in the 70s and 80s. That's when members from both parties would get together and hang out. They might represent, you know, might be members of different parties, but they still got along. They still found common ground. And that's really what we're missing in this day and age. And the one thing, you know, I talked about this a few episodes ago with Jim Bathurst. You know, Jim and I trained together. We were personal trainers together in D.C. We talk about fitness being a unifying factor. You know, I tend to vote Democratic. I don't vote for the party. I vote for the individual. But I have a lot of respect for the Republican presidents who, like George W. Bush, who've been a good example for health and fitness. I certainly don't agree with him or didn't agree with him for a number of issues of his policy decisions, but that's different. I really respected President Bush because of the example he set when he was in office. And when I was actually in San Francisco in 2010, my wife and I stayed at a hotel, and this is no joke, in 2010, we were, we were visiting San Francisco, and it was the same week that President Obama was there. I think he was doing something either Apple or Facebook or, or one of the dot-coms, but we ended up being in the same hotel as President Obama. The next morning, my wife and I were walking into the fitness center to get our workout on when President Obama was coming out of the fitness center. Now, I would have reached for my phone to take a selfie with him, but there are a couple of really burly guys with guns there, and I didn't want to move my hands too quickly because, you know, you get taken down pretty quickly. Those guys are trained to, to do split-second reactions. So it's really good to see that, you know, I point that out. Whether you're a fan of President Obama or not, no matter what, he was a good example of staying, staying in shape. He famously played basketball. His wife famously worked out. You know, in fact, the organization I used to work with, the American Council on Exercise, used to work quite closely with Michelle Obama on the Let's Move campaign. You know, as I mentioned in in, in the introduction, this is an important issue. You know, we're looking at having, you know, government, you know, government affordability for healthcare going away. If healthcare is left to the private market, goodness, how much expensive is that going to be? You know, people can barely afford healthcare as it is. You know, the one thing you can do, the one thing you can do to promote good health is be physically active on a regular basis and make smart, healthy nutrition choices. And that can go a long way to ensure that you have a healthy, active lifestyle for years and years to come. I mean, hey, if you want to be sick, if you want to spend your time in the doctor's office, if you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars you know, on medical bills, by all means, make poor food decisions. You know, eschew, you know, avoid physical activity. You know, that's, that's why we got into the discussion in the first place. That's what our president is doing now. You know, and the unfortunate thing is people are going to see President Trump and they're going to use that as an example. You know, people may have seen George W. Bush. People may have seen Barack Obama and said, hey, if he can do it, I can do it too. That's called vicarious experiences. If you can relate to somebody, then it makes, you, it makes it easier for you to participate in the same behavior. So if you were a working, you know, if you're a working father of two, like George W. Bush or Barack Obama, you saw them working out despite an incredibly hectic schedule. That can set a little motivation say, hey, maybe I can do that too. And that's what it's all about. Like I said in the intro again, I don't expect our president to be a bodybuilder. I certainly don't expect our president to be winning any CrossFit contests. But I do expect 
that our president and other elected officials set an example and play an active role in promoting a healthy lifestyle. You know, does that mean having a scoop of ice cream every now and then? Sure. But that might be after you go for a jog. That might be after you do a hard workout. So not sure where I'm going with all this, except to say that it's really important. You know, our politicians are a reflection of who we are. Right now, our political, you know, what's going on in politics in America is a reflection of the differences in our country. You know, red versus blue, Central America versus the, the coast. You know, this needs to go away. We all should be working together for a common purpose. We really should. And exercise is one thing that can bring everybody together. I don't care about your political background. You know, you show up in a fitness class, I just want to make sure you get a good workout. You know, I may disagree with you on a few whatever issues, but that's not a big deal. I want to make sure you're healthy. And here's the deal, folks. If you and I are working out, if we're exercising, we're going to be paying for those people that aren't exercising. So I don't know what the solution is, but there has to be a way that we, we can promote more physical activity. Does that mean more sidewalks? Does that mean more bike trails? Does that mean more access to health clubs and making it more affordable? Does that mean getting a tax break for joining a health club? All these things are options. So if you're interested in this issue, get involved in politics. If you haven't gotten involved in politics in the last seven months, well, now's the time to start doing that. We're going to have a very, very tumultuous 2018 election season. I'm already starting to get involved here in, in San Diego, North County, San Diego, because I know that we can make a difference. And I know that if we get the right people in office, I'm not worried about other things, but I want to really set an example and get people to realize that they need to take responsibility for their own health by being physically active and making healthy nutrition choices. So that's what today's episode was all about, I guess. You know, how do we, how do, we do that? Does it start with the president? I think it does. I think when people see somebody like that being active on a regular basis, it gives them, the, it encourages them to do the same. If they see a president who avoids physical activity and chooses gluttonous food that can really expand his waistline, well, we already got enough of that in America and we don't need any more. Anyway, this is a little different episode than I normally do. Hopefully you enjoyed it. It was a really fun conversation. I really enjoyed talking with Dr. Prestrizella. I look forward to having her back again where we talk a little bit more about the historical perspective of fitness and how that impacts us today. If you have any comments on today's episode, as I'm sure you will, you can contact me, Pete, at Pete McCall Fitness. Feel free to tweet at me, at PeteMC underscore fitness. And you can always catch me on Instagram, Pete McCall underscore fitness. Thanks for stopping by for this episode of All About Fitness. Stay active and have a great day.